What a delight it was to chat with Mayor Grayson Vandegrift of Midway, Kentucky. I especially loved his passion for learning and his heart for service. I'm going to push the play button on today's episode and just let her roll. And then I'll meet you on the other side with my higher ground takeaways. But first, a few reminders. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Choose to Think podcast. And if you haven't subscribed just yet, please do. And while you're at it, if you would share the link from your favorite episode with a friend, I would really appreciate this. I'm humbly praying that God would use my voice in this platform to be encouragement and inspiration in our world. We really need it nowadays, wouldn't you say? And you know what? You have no idea what a privilege it is to serve in this way. I'm having a ton of fun with this podcast, and I would love your feedback. Also, consider joining the faith-based C2T private Facebook group to chat about a variety of things, especially about how to deal with toxic thoughts, emotions, and mindsets. We can challenge each other. We can converse about the podcast episodes. I would love to have listeners way in there. And finally, pop on over to my website, victoriadwalker.com, to find a gazillion downloadable freebies with can-do exercises to help you take thoughts captive. You'll see I've created what I call a visual gallery of gratitude. If you're feeling low and need a bit of a boost, check out this slideshow gallery. And now, on with the show. Welcome, Mayor Grayson. It is such a delight to have you on the Choose to Think podcast. And I know just like nothing about you. So this is going to be such a fun interview today. But thank you for being here. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Victoria. Oh, my pleasure. So You know, actually, I said I know nothing about you, but one thing I do know about you is that you have played basketball on Monday nights with my boys, with Eddie and Matthew, and they could not have been more delighted when that day that you showed up. I don't know. Do you still go? I haven't gone in a while. They they have really uh, shown my age to me very I've realized I realized after a few times going that you know I'm the 37 year old guy playing with a bunch of 20 year olds uh, and, and early 30s guys that are also in a lot better shape than me. I know. I still so, plan on going, but uh, I just don't go that often because I, I hurt too too much to that following. I know. You know what? I think they do too. There have been many a day when when the, the next morning they're like, "Man, that just that ripped me last night." So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I know. I know how that is. You're, I don't think you're alone in being sore from something like that. But <laughs> oh, okay, Mayor Grayson, can you tell us just about yourself? Because that's about the only little detail that I know. But I, I mean, are you a Kentuckian? Did you grow up here in Kentucky or something about your background? Maybe you could share with us. So uh, even though I was technically born in a hospital in Frankfort, Kentucky, I was raised in Georgetown, Kentucky uh, and or in parts of Scott County that are unincorporated. So I mostly grew up uh, close to Midway in what's called Ironworks Estates. And that's a subdivision uh, just near the Scott County, Woodford County border near Elkhorn Creek. Uh, and that's where I grew up. I'm I, I'm a Creek boy. Uh, I grew up um, out there, you know, about two miles from the Woodford County border in Scott County. Although for part of my uh, childhood, we did live in, in Georgetown proper. Uh, and my, my father uh, owned a construction company. He's retired now, but he owned Vandergriff Construction, and uh, which was mostly based in Georgetown. And he mostly built custom homes there. Uh, but my mom is still a practicing paralegal at Wyatt, Terrett and Combs. Um, but I grew up there. I went through the Scott County school system through eighth grade, and then I went to Sayre for high school. Um, and that was sort of a decision my parents made that uh, was a was a big sacrifice for them. They they they've always worked their their tails off, and uh, there was some there were some issues at the time with the Scott County school system, uh, which I think have since been resolved. My parents weren't super happy about. My sister, by the way, teaches at Scott County, so I love the Scott County school system. Not not uh, knocking them at all, but it just didn't. I, it just things weren't working well for me at the time. Uh, you know, my parents had started me in uh, uh, elementary school. I started kindergarten when I was four, which uh, they came to regret uh, because, of course, you know. Uh, Females tend to mature quicker than males, and that's been no different in my experience either. Uh, and 
you know, I, I was an athlete. I wanted to, uh, you know, play basketball, but I was a seventh grader, you know, uh, trying out for the seventh or, you know, I was a seventh grader essentially trying out for the eighth grade basketball team. And, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hurt that comes in that knowing that you're probably good enough to play, but you're a year behind in your maturity. And, and, and you know, at that age, goodness, a, a, you know, a 13 year old to a 14 year old is like a lifetime compared to, you know, when you're, when you're 32 compared to a 33 year old, not much different, but when you're in those formative years, it matters. And, um, you know, the, the, the school system was not eager to allow me to stay back a year, which is what my parents wanted to do. And that was a, that was frustrating because we knew other people who were being allowed to do that. And so uh, my parents decided to move me to Sayre and they were able to afford it. Uh, thankfully, it was not easy for them to do. Uh, and I was the kid at Sayre driving the 1983 Grand Prix into the parking lot. Um uh, Parking it next to Beamers and SUVs and those types of things, and uh, that was not lost on anybody. Uh, but I, I'm glad I'm glad they did it. It was a great experience for me, uh, staying back a year. So I, I repeated the eighth grade, not due to academic reasons, but due to just maturity reasons. Um, and I, I'm glad I did it. You know, there were things about Sayer I, I didn't particularly love, but uh, I don't know of anybody that particularly loved everything in, that happened in high school. But I got to play sports, and that was that was huge for me. Um, and, you know, it ended up leading to one of the most, I guess, maybe formative experiences in my life as, uh, you know, I became a very good player there and uh, was, you know, basically the, you know, the team's best player. My, my junior year, uh, first game of the season, I was in a basketball injury that typically is reserved for uh, motorcycle accidents and things like that. I, I, I ruptured my pancreas uh, in wow. game and that basically I landed on another player's knee and it was just one of those freak things and um, strange accident where uh, essentially, you know, the doctors later on said, we can't believe this happened in a basketball game. But I ended up spending 17 days in the hospital uh, and about a week after them not being able to figure out exactly what was going on with my swollen pancreas, they decided to do exploratory surgery and they realized that it had cracked in half against my spinal column in the fall. Uh, again, a very bizarre injury for a basketball game. So I hit the the unlucky lottery in that sense, but it really, if I had that not happened to me, I think my life would have been completely different because I think I would have gone on to play basketball in college. Uh, I did come back to play my senior year, but, but something about that whole experience knocked the, the wind out of my sails to want to play, continue playing sports. And really while I was down for about a year, uh, really, really down for about six months, you know, to the injury, I learned to play uh, piano and guitar and uh, even started writing my own songs. And that kind of really led my life in a different direction. So um, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I love the Scott County school system, but uh, having gone to Sayre for um, high school kind of led to, to, maybe a bad thing leading to other good things, if that makes sense. So it's. Oh, sure. You know, it is so impressive that during your, your convalescence and so forth, that you, you kind of switched over and began with piano and guitar, playing guitar and writing songs. What a wonderful pivot that you made during a really hard time. Was that mainly because you were just not able to move around so much or had you always had interest in those sorts of things? Or was it just like, I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. I'm going to learn how to play the piano because I've heard, I've heard you play some on Facebook recently. Um, <laughs> some of your clips. So uh -huh. how, did, how did that come about for you? What did that look like? Well, I, I guess my, my interest in music had been growing for a few years, but um I think having that time and, and you're right, I, I was just not as mobile. It was difficult to, to move around. I uh, literally, my muscles had been so kind of changed by that surgery that I, I almost couldn't stand up straight even for about a month after I got out of the hospital. And even after that, it was difficult. So it, it, it totally transformed my life. There was also a huge mental component to all of it. I, I remember asking this, why did this happen? It was just, it just seemed so random. And and again, I think I'm the only guy ever to rupture his pancreas in a basketball game, which I've <laughs> been able to refute that claim. But um, it, it just, it, I, there were so many questions. And, you know, you're 17, you know, when you're 17, there's so many questions anyway. Uh, so I think it happened because I had the time and uh, it was such a transformational period in my life that I, it was almost like I was looking 
uh, to do something different and to may- maybe to make meaning out of it all. Uh, and that's where I started kind of going there. And, and as I started doing it, I just loved it. I loved it more and more. And my love for that uh, was, you know, eclipsed my love for playing basketball, which, you know, I was, you know, a young man before all this. Uh, I was obsessed with basketball. I mean, I, I practiced all the time. I, I made sure that I was, you know, in the kind of shape that I, that I could play in college. And uh, and it just all sort of, after that, my my focus was, I really just loved music. I loved writing and I loved uh, exploring what music can sort of unlock. And uh, it just, it just kind of led from there. Wonderful. So fast forward just a teeny bit. Where did you end up? Where did you land for college? Ended up going to Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. That's a small liberal arts college between uh, Columbus, Ohio, and and Dayton, Ohio. Um, And uh, went there and I I studied English was, uh, you know, because at that time I still was really focused on music and I wanted to be a writer of some kind. And I still to this day love writing. I I just typically tend to write political things now, you know, I mean, you know, political policy for the city, but, um, but I still love to write. So uh, I went there uh, and then I did attend the University of Kentucky for a year as well. Um, but I'm glad it was a good experience though, you know, getting out of, you know, cause again, I grew up in Kentucky. I'd never spent any time anywhere else. It was a great experience, but, but I, I definitely missed home. I, I, I've proven to be a homebody. Time. Have, have you been out of the country by chance? I have, only, I have only been to Canada and the Cayman Islands. Uh, okay. And both of those were just little vacations. So, um, but I've never been to Europe or to, you know, Asia or anything like that. I hate flying, Victoria. I hate flying. <laughs> you have to, you have to get me, uh, you know, I mean, I have to really just, you know, either have a drink or I need a, I need a medicine or something to, I just, I would get in that metal tube and that thing starts moving. And I just think this is natural to leave the ground. Uh, so, um, uh, so I'll fly, but it, it's, it's only under um, circumstances that to really agree to, <laughs> to do it. Oh my gosh. So we are so opposite on that because I love to fly. I, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> ear to ear as the plane is taking off and going down the runway. I'm like, I'm like giddy because it is to me, it is just the most amazing <laughs> experience. So I love it. But. I used to love it. I used to love it. But as I've gotten <laughs> older. I've gotten more curmudgeon about it. I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. So now here you are in Midway. Tell us a little bit about your family as well as your aspirations. Did you ever in a million years think, you know what I'm going to do in life? I'm going to be the mayor of Midway, Kentucky. How did that come about? Never would have, never would have thought about it uh, really uh, up until a certain point. Uh, My uh, family and I decided to buy what was called Court Cafe in downtown Midway in 2007. And, and although I never grew up in Midway, um, I, you know, of course, uh, did uh, grow up near here. And so we were always familiar, you know, we'd always come and eat at the restaurants. And my parents especially loved to go eat at the Old Depot restaurant uh, when I was growing up. And so uh, I had worked in, in the meantime, uh, after college, I had worked in and manage, uh, you know, restaurants and retail. So I had some experience there, but um, we were kind of a classic case of probably didn't realize what we were getting into when we started out. Um, and we took over Court Cafe in 2007 in downtown Midway. And, you know, it was a great experience. Back then, that was a little cafe that basically did quiche and scones and things like that. Uh, but uh, wound up really being uh, an excellent uh, experience because we were able to kind of convert that into that into that current restaurant uh, that that it is right now. So, um, uh, which one is it? So now it's where Mezzo is Mezzo okay. Main Cafe. So over the year, so we we ran uh, Quirk uh, and then we turned it in to a full scale restaurant, um, which was kind of our dream there to get a full scale restaurant and bar, and we converted that to that around the year 2010, and we changed the name to 815. Uh, and, uh, we wanted, you know, it was called 815 cause we wanted it to sound like a train time and the timing of it was that it was going to be opened literally on August 15th, of 2010, sort of our transition date mm-hmm. so on 815, trying to have like the train theme. Uh, and of course the tavern was downstairs in the basement, kind of that has a cheers feel to it. The upstairs more have a, of the dining feel to it. 
and, and we ran it the next five years up until 2015 as 815. Uh, uh, and in and, and, and all this meantime, and you know, Quirk and, and 815, that's when I sort of started to get more involved in politics. And how it started was actually with the Midway Business Association. Um, in 2007, uh, I was really unhappy. Uh, somebody posted on uh, this was this would have been uh, December Christmas Eve, 2007. I went to check on some things in the restaurant. We were closed uh, for Christmas Eve, and there was a note on the door from one of the merchants saying, "We're sorry, this restaurant decided not to serve you today, but so and so restaurant, the best in town down the street, is open, and they will gladly serve you since they decided not to." And boy, that fired me up. I thought, you know, we deserve a day or two off to spend with our family as hard as we work uh, and let our employees off. So uh, I threatened to quit as a member of the business association. And two weeks later, they asked me to be their president. <laughs> so, Oh my. So, uh, and I, I mean, and, and I really was about to quit. I was so mad about this. Anyway, so I became president of the business association in 2008 and then was reelected to that in 2009. And that's not public office, but it really got me in the bug for kind of serving others because the point of the of the association was to to, to push as it still is is to to push you know uh, business downtown to help these local you know brick and mortar retailers and restaurants uh, to um, you know be able to survive and make it in a town like this where you don't have the kind of foot traffic you have in bigger cities. And it also kind of gets you involved in local politics just naturally. Uh, there's a crossover there. And I just sort of started to feel the bug for it, you know. And um, we had a young president at the time, you know, uh, a kind of a JFK-esque type of feeling in the air. And I think that's why you see a lot of young people, by the way, whether their politics align with uh, Barack Obama or not. You know, when you see a young person like you in the White House, you just think, well, heck, you know. I can get involved in politics. And I think that happened in the 60s, too. Uh, and so it just, you know, the bug kind of hit me for that. I started to get more and more involved, started to to uh, watch things more and more. And so that's where it all kind of came from. And then, you know, in, in, in 2012, I decided to run for city council and, and, and was fortunate enough to, to be elected to that. And even then, I just I, even then I didn't really imagine being mayor necessarily, but as luck and circumstances and just, you know, some things that I felt needed to be changed or, or at least maybe a, a different type of direction than the city I think was going to possibly go in. Uh, I, I just, well, you, you know, you, you believe in serving. Uh, this is a way of giving back. And I never served in the military or anything. So I decided to run for mayor. I was very passionate about it in 2014. I was not supposed to win. Um, I was told by many people I was not supposed to win. In fact, I, I had friends trying to talk me out of it, saying, you're not going to win this one. You, you, you really need to just stick with city council. And I said, well, I said, you know, I, I throw my hat over the wall on this. I got to go chase it. And 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 I, I really, the funny thing is, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not a hyper confident person. So I just believed in and in, in sort of what, I, what my message was and the vision that a lot of people agreed with me on. And I knew that they agreed with me on this at least, you know, enough people to, to kind of start a base that I really thought that I had a good chance. And uh, lo and behold, you know, I, I, I won a, I won a you know, pretty close race in 2014 over a very good opponent uh, and a very good person. We just happened to see eye to eye and, you know, or see a little bit differently than eye to eye in a couple of things. Um, and that's how it is in politics, you know, but, um, you know, I think I got about 53% of the vote. It was, you know, in midway, it was close. I mean, it was, you know, 49 votes, you know, separating. So when I, so I became mayor in 2014 and I, and I knew, I said, well, I got a lot of people to, to sort of win over in the city. And I, so I was very pleased. And when I was reelected in 2018 with, with the margin, it was a much, much bigger margin. And, um, I'm just glad to know that I've been able to do a good job to not only be reelected, but to win, to win a lot of people over that, that, that didn't believe necessarily that I was the right choice the first time. That's a, that's a very, that's a very gratifying thought, but it doesn't, you don't get cocky from that. I still am like, well, I want to win those people over. I still didn't get, you know, so you, you, you could want to continue to be better and be the mayor uh, for everybody. Uh, even if they don't, you know, necessarily uh, support you in elections, you're still their mayor and they're still good people. Small town elections are the hardest ones because everybody kind of knows each other. Everybody kind of likes each other. Um, and it's, you know, you, you got to pick those things. So you can't take anything personally. And, and I've learned that uh, over the years. Before we move on, let's take a quick break from our sponsors. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so that kind of brings me to this question. I would think that being an elected official, that you're essentially in the, quote, people pleasing business. Mm -hmm. But I also know, I mean, you just said, okay, you can't take, you know, all of this personally. But can you unpack that just a little bit? Because how do you really do that? I mean, let's say you ruffle feathers. But, you know, you want to kind of smooth things over. How do you not feel rejected occasionally? And if you do, what do you, how do you deal with that? Does this make sense as a question? Yes. Yes. And it's a, it's a a very good question. And it's a a complicated study really in the human mind, I think in many ways, Um, you know, your, your, your skin thickens, but it never becomes, uh, not skin, you know, so to speak. So um, the way I look at it is I feel like your blood thickens in a sense. And, um, you, you know, I, I do, I, I think being elected official is definitely being in the people uh, pleasing business and excuse me. <coughs> and, um, you know, uh, you have to understand that uh, it's actually an honor. Uh, and when I say you have to understand, I mean the elected official, you know, like me, myself, I have to understand that this is an honor serve. And, and I do. When we say it's a privilege and an honor, you know, it's not lip service, at least not for me. And I think for many others, because the the thing is, is that um, people overall have a bad view of politicians. Um, and that, that that comes from mostly from the federal level um, and not because of who's in the White House, because that's that 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 feeling uh, transcends whether it's a Democrat or Republican. Um, just in general, when politics are less local, you see the more of the mudslinging, you see more of the dirty side of politics, uh, and you just don't see that at a local level because there's such a smaller hemisphere that you're working in, so to speak. Uh, so we, we we operate on a more pure level, but people still have that stigma for you that you can't be trusted, that you must be, you know, um, you know, up to no good or you must be in it for yourself. And so that's difficult at times because people can come to me sometimes and, and I can just tell they, they, they don't think I'll be able to help them or they don't think I'll care or they think I'll have some ulterior motive. And that is, that can be like almost offensive because you're like, man, you don't know me, you know, you you don't know my, my background, my history, but then you stop and say, no, they're, they're, they're not mad at you personally. They're not mad at Grayson. They're mad because there's a situation happening that they need help with. And, um, they may be coming at it at an angle that can sound a little, you know, hurtful at first, but that just comes with the territory. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to not let some things take, you know, you know, hit you personally, especially when someone criticizes you, you know, we're all human. Uh, but, uh, you're, you're, you know, my skin is way thicker than it was, you know, when I first took office in January one of 2015, uh, and it continues to thicken. Um, I, I, I think it, what it comes down to is it's your passion for service. You know, um, my, what bothers me is that when, when somebody has an issue, I want it to be fixed and, and, and it bothers me until it's fixed. And if it's an issue that can't be fixed, uh, it, re- it really makes me double down and figure out how to fix it. I, and I, I can proudly say, I don't think anyone's brought me an issue that we weren't at least able to make a dent in. I'm not saying we could fix it. And I, I give you something like speeding. Speeding is one of the most difficult issues to tackle. Uh, a, because most of us do it without thinking about it. Um, but also because it's difficult to stop it without doing what I call plain whack-a-mole. Uh, and, you know, the point is that, yes, you can hand out a ticket, but it's not like the whole world knows that someone got a ticket just now. Uh, see, what we've done is we've tried to have more of a comprehensive strategy, like getting more edge lines painted on streets. Uh, and believe it or not, painting streets more with lines actually makes people slow down. There's the numerous studies all over the world that show that. Uh, and now we're also looking at further things, you know, possible speed tables, which are like very, very mild speed bumps that you'll see in bigger cities sometimes might be a solution or, or, or what I call concrete bulb outs where on really wide roads, uh, the concrete, uh, sidewalk actually can stick out into the road a little bit and it's like a curb, but it shortens the distance for pedestrians and it creates, uh, a obstruction for drivers. Those types of things, uh, work. And my, my point is, is that, while we have not solved speeding, and frankly, we will never solve speeding, it started right as soon as cars were put on the road, and it will continue, we, we've tackled the problem. So I just can't think of a problem we haven't tackled. 
And it's because I want people, when they come to me with a difficult issue, I want them to know that, A, I'm never going to just say, well, we can't do that. And, and B, I'm, I'm going to give it every possible uh, shot and every possible angle. And, and, I, and I've been proud. I really think when you work with people and, you know, you, you work with your, you know, you know the, 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 the city council that you've been elected to work with, um, it's amazing what you can accomplish. And it's amazing what we have. But I, I attribute it so much of that to the community in and of itself. So I don't think I really answered that question perfectly. But it's, it's a, it, 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 the, the, the main crux is, is that, yes, there's times when it can be a little defeating to feel like you work so hard and there's still someone around the corner saying that you're a, that, that, that you're screwing up or they're saying B you're not doing good enough. Or they're just saying, what are you going to do about this problem? This problem has been here forever. You've done nothing about it. And it might be an issue that in reality has not been around forever, but maybe it's just something that I'm just now becoming more aware of. Uh, it, you know, it can kind of hurt you a little bit, but it, a, it comes to the territory. If you're not, if you can't stand that, then you just, you gotta, you're in the wrong business. Uh, but B, you again, have to remember that it's not personal. These are people who care and they're being afflicted by an issue. And that's what you were elected to solve. And, that, and that's what I love doing. It's why I love this job. Well, let me roll it back just a teeny bit. You said two things. Number one, a passion for service. You have a passion for service. Mm -hmm. And then number two, in in my words, like there's no mountain that's too high. In other words, we're going to, if there's a problem, we're going to face it and do all that we can do to solve it. Where did you pick up those kinds of mindsets or attitudes along the way? Can, I mean, what did, was this modeled from your childhood or was is there someone inspiring you? Because those are some really powerful uh, personal characteristics and mindsets even to have. And where did, how did that develop in your life? Those two, the passion for service and, you know, I'm going to come at this problem and we're going to, we're going to go full force at it here and solve it. Where'd that come from? Well, I, I think um, probably from a couple different places, but certainly, you know, my parents and my upbringing. I mean, I had a wonderful childhood. My dad, uh, Rob, and my mom, Sarah, I don't call them that, but just, just to, to personalize them, um, just wonderful, caring parents. Um, and my sister, Julie, just, um, you know, I, I could not have had a better childhood. I, I just, you know, every memory of childhood uh, that involves them is just a good memory. Uh, so I think, um, you know, but I think where my passion comes from is a little bit more of a mystery. I, I really think it's a it's a search for um, for meaning in the sense that, um, you know, we have this finite amount of time on this earth. And we all have struggles and to make meaning of them, I think is where, I think that's where my passion comes from is, is, um, what can you do to know that at the end of all this, you know, you, you, you did something good, you know, you were a net positive for good. You, you left something behind that even if it's not particularly remembered for you, you know, you know, that when you go back into the earth, that, um, your time here was well spent. And then I think the, the sort of the, the drive to to overcome things that uh, you're told you can't do comes from a lot of experiences in my childhood uh, where, for example, I was told, you know, again, I was a young kid, uh, about, a, about a year younger than the kids I was playing with. They're saying, you're, you'll never be good enough to play sports, you know, on the on the high school level and then proving, you know, and so then but I, I knew I could, you know, I knew I had a bit of an obstacle in front of me. And I was able to overcome it. And I think that gives you a lot of confidence. And then, you know, it's the it's also the obstacle of, you know, I injured myself and I came back into my senior year and I was real hesitant. You know, I was I was really not the kind of player I was. But throughout the year, and, but I was, it was it frustrated me because I wasn't as good. Uh, but then you know, I was good, but I had I had totally changed my game. My, my, my quick example is I had stopped being the kind of player that goes to the basket and draws contact and gets, you know, gets an easy layup or something and started becoming a three point shooter. Well, that's good. But the problem is my game was not um, totally um all, you know, I didn't have an all around game. Well, as the senior year went on, I overcame that, that fear. And I started going back to the basket and that made me a better three point shooter because players had to guard me differently. And, and you know, ended up having a great senior year. Um, so, you know, that kind of obstacle. And then I remember even the obstacle when I was first learning to play music, I, I, I couldn't sing a lick. I could not find, I, I was, I was tone deaf in the sense that 
I just couldn't find the right tone and I didn't know it. And people I think were listening to me saying, goodness gracious, he sounds awful. <laughs> and generally you either can sing or you can't, right? Well, I learned that's not true actually. Um, so I started working on it and I even worked with, uh, some, 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 like, you know, Sayer was a, well, one thing about a great school at Sayer is there was elective programs that even taught music theory. And what kind of school can you go and actually learn music theory in high school? And uh, I learned how to find the note, how to realize, how to know what note I'm actually singing and that it matches. So I'm not Pavarotti, never will be, but uh, but I can carry a tune and, and I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket to start uh, with. So I guess over time, it's like, don't tell me what I can't do because I can do it. And that still drives me to this day. When I first became mayor, they said, you've got to stop talking about how you're going to lower water bills. It can't be done in midway. Uh, and, and that just drove me to figure it out. And we did. And we still have more plans. To, um, and that'll take a little bit of time too, but uh, it's that oftentimes uh, drive me. Sorry, that's my Rico going, going crazy over okay. here. Um, I wonder one thing, Mayor, what is, can you think of something that, that you would say, you know, I just never was able to pull this off. And this can be just in general in your life. Anything that you said, nope, I just, I just can't do that. Or did you ever kind of just quit on something? You know, um, yes, there is. And, and, and typically, um, I would say that, uh, cause uh, my, 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 when I, my first in my head, when you asked that question, I thought, no, the answer is no. I, the, the things that, that I, you know, uh, that are difficult, I'm still like, you know, no, we're, we're, we're you know, these this things are still going to happen, but there is one thing and it was college. I, 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 I gave up on college. I did not graduate. I, um, I have, you know, I have four years in of college and no, no degree to show for it. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, but you know, the main reason was just, you know, you know, probably some, some dumb decisions as a, as a young man, um, uh, certainly some decisions my parents, uh, weren't happy with at the time, but I, I became disillusioned with college for many different reasons. Um, I think partly is because I'll be honest with you, uh, Sayer is a phenomenally good high school. I mean, just phenomenally uh, good education that I received there. And, um, I got to college and felt frustrated with some courses I was taking that felt like I was, you know, really just kind of back in, in, in college, but also just in general, that time in my life, you know, I think I felt some bitterness about things. Maybe it was still dealing with why I had this bizarre injury that just uh, didn't make any sense. And, and, and what was that going to lead towards, you know, in my head, maybe it was just other frustrations, uh, you know, personal and otherwise, uh, but yeah, that's one thing. And, and there's, you know, it, it doesn't eat me up all that much, to be honest with you, but it is something that I did, you know, I, I did say, no, I, I, it wasn't that it was too difficult is that I just could not put forth. I could not find it in me to put forth the effort to finish. And there's days when I kind of regret it, but for the most part, honestly, I, I really, I really kind of don't, I still got a good education. Uh, and, and I just don't have that, that, that piece of paper to show for it. Um, but, um, you know, and it's more than a piece of paper. I, I get that, but but there are things about the educational system in general that I think um, may have gotten better since then. But I, I remember being very disillusioned with some things back in college. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, you know, there is a lot of pressure for our graduates to head on to mm -hmm. higher education. You know, I am yeah. a, a higher education instructor, and. So I, I truly value higher education. I'm sure you do sure, too. Cool, but yeah. Yes. But there's sometimes I, I wonder though about all the pressure we put on our, our graduating seniors from high school that, you know, you've got to go to college, you've got to go to college, you've got to go to, to the university. And when really there's been considerable pushback on that and just, you know, get Kentucky back to work, right? right? And all the different trades that we have that are, you know, there's a big push to resurrect some of those. But, um, but so I think that I understood what you said, though, is that you never really have stood under the shadow. You've regretted that, but you've never let that get the most of you because you, right. you just said, nope, I've, I'm, I'm going on that You've reckoned with it, I guess. Did I get that right? Yes. I mean, I, I, I know why I made the decision. And I think if I had to do it all over again, I think in the circumstances, I would have done the same thing again. Now, what I, the, what I regret about it is I regret my parents spent a buttload of money on a, on a 
you know, degree I never got. Um, but I don't even think they particularly regret it because I, you know, I've put it to them before. I said, I still got all the education, you know, I, I still, I still learned everything. Um, but you know, there's a bit of a rebel in me, uh, Victoria, there's a bit of me that kind of, uh, I don't like someone telling me what I have to do. <laughs> so, uh, and that was probably even worse when I was in my early twenties. Uh, and yeah, I, I do think we were making that mistake. Plus I, I came up in that generation where, you know, not 10 years before that, uh, before I graduated uh, high school, 10 years before that, you know, you went to college because that got you a good job. Uh, and it became clear to my generation in college that that wasn't the case anymore, that that just a, a graduate degree didn't necessarily mean you were going to get a good job. I mean, you either need to go on to get a master's and teach, or which I had no interest in, or you you had to be in the right field, which I was not in, to, uh, you know, an English degree, not going to get you a whole lot uh, from, you know, a bachelor's point. And then, of course, my generation also, you know, was, was coming of age during the Great Recession as well. So, um, you know, there was just a lot of things to be uh, – uh, somewhat disillusioned by, um, but that's true of any generation, of course. But yeah, no, you're right. I, I don't feel like I live under any shadow of it. But yeah, you know, it's one of those things that at times is like, you know, would, would have been a nice thing, especially for my parents to to have followed through. Right, right. I have I have one more question too sure. uh, that kind of goes along with this. Obviously, you've been very successful, and I wonder where you picked up that entrepreneurial spirit that you have. I mean, you you know, you said, "Okay, we're going to open this restaurant." Where did that come from in within you? What what? How was that birthed, really? Oh, my my, my dad, no doubt about it. You know, my my dad uh, built uh, a very successful custom building uh, outfit from the ground up. And uh, what I'm so proud about is that my dad built beautiful custom homes and he was not the kind of guy in an office telling other people what to do. He did. He built it himself. Now, with about three or four other guys, Now he, he would hire subcontractors to do the plumbing or to do the electric work, of course. But but they built the frame. You know, they they laid the foundation. They built the frame. Uh, and those houses not only uh, still stand, we talk to people all the time who say, your dad built the best home we've ever lived in. That thing's never had a single problem. My dad is an enormous perfectionist. It is annoying to work with him on these things. <laughs> um, he will sit and look at an angle and, you know, I- I'll be amazed. You know, I'm like, goodness, I just realized you're using the Pythagorean theorem. And he's like, yeah, that's how you make sure a room is squared. And, uh, you know, and and you can't find a mismeasurement in a home he built. I mean, but you know, what it meant is that they built really nice homes that took them a year to build because it was him and three other guys. But um, what what it showed me was that if you work really hard and you're good to people, and what better way to lead people than to be willing to do the work yourself? And if you're good to people and you uh, do good work, you're going to be successful. So I, I got the entrepreneurial spirit from him, no doubt about it. And and I still use a lot of the, the lessons I've learned from him and the lessons I learned from running a restaurant for uh, eight years. Uh, and what I do as mayor, I mean, and, and there's a lot of things that translate well there, like, you know, being efficient, you know, running an efficient operation, um, making sure your employees know they're well taken care of and that, you know, the, when they know that their boss cares for them, they'll work harder. And, and when they also know that there's more in it for them, like uh, a good job that pays well with good benefits, you know, that there's more in it for them. Uh, and eight people who are well motivated are going to be way more productive than 16 who aren't. Uh, and those kind of things still follow me to this day, but it definitely came from, from my, my dad. Wonderful. That's wonderful. And, you know, I, I want to personally thank you and perhaps on behalf of Midway, if I could even go so far as to say that, but I know twice since we have lived here and we moved in, I think it was 2004 and twice since I've been here or and relatively recently, I've come to you with just a couple of kind of pesky um, issues and they're not even earth shattering or shaking by any stretch. They, they were not pesky. They are. But my goodness, your reception of those, you know, you heard me out, you validated my feelings and which made me just feel so good. I'm like, gosh, he really cares. And <laughs> And you picked up the torch on these, on these issues, and by golly, it's like the next day they're solved. It's over. It's done. And 
And I would just like to say thank you so much for doing that. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you a little bit more. Getty's been saying, hey, have you talked with the mayor yet? And I'm like, well, not yet, but that's coming. So I can't wait to tell him that I got to know you just a little bit more. And we really appreciate your service. And thank you so much for leading with passion and for really caring and applying everything that you've learned. You're just doing such a wonderful job. And we really appreciate you. Well, I really appreciate you saying that, Victoria, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just add this real quickly if I can. Um, you know, uh, you, you're you, the, I don't I don't recall I recall one of them, I don't recall the other, one, but it's never pesky. It's never pesky, and you know, one, one, of, my, one of my goals in all of this, and, and my you know, and and wherever wherever this career takes me, is that I want to help to change the the word politician from a bad word to a good. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you saying that because that's my goal is that uh, there's no issue too small because in reality, um, any issue that matters to somebody is not a small issue. But also, uh, I think it's important that government starts to act a little bit more like business in the sense that uh, we don't have to be slow just for the sake of being slow. There are times when government has to be slow. There, 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 are, there are situations that are so complicated, they require the funding or they require other logistics. But there are also situations that can be taken care of with good old-fashioned elbow grease. And uh, government, and I think over the, over the decades and, and generations, has allowed itself to be a little bit lax in those areas. And I, and I think we need to improve there. So I really appreciate um, you saying that because it's a big, that's a big passion of mine too in, in public service, but I, I really, and everything you said is so, so kind. And uh, it's also very easy to, to be mayor in a city like Midway where we just have these wonderful people who are caring and thoughtful and, 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 and really pay attention. I mean, the people of Midway really pay attention and that, it goes a long way. If our entire electorate in this country uh, was that way, I, I think we'd be a better country for it. Let me just say that after the interview concluded, it was no problem for me to come up with some higher ground takeaways. And here they are. Number one, learn to roll with the punches that life throws at you, even the likes of a ruptured pancreas. Number two, Use your frustration, your passion, your backbone to serve. Number three, take a risk now and then. Go ahead. Throw your hat over the wall and run to catch it. You might be pleasantly surprised at the outcome. Number four, yes, over time and with experience, our skin thickens, but it's still skin. Try not to take things too personally. Be an empathetic listener and work to find a necessary solution. Number five, remember it's an honor and a privilege to serve. Whom are you serving today? Number six, when it's all been said and done, will you be a net positive for good? What legacy are you and I leaving? Number seven, and I love this one, you can sing if you want to. Don't let let past comments or narratives prohibit you from stepping out and trying something new. Work hard at it to improve. Number eight, you have a unique purpose in this life and in this world. God created you to shine. He's gifted you to do what nobody else on this earth can do. Step into your calling. And number nine, lead by doing the work yourself. Pick up the hammer and move. Remember, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He led by serving. Now let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for our town of Midway. Thank you for this tightly knit community and all those living here, from the small business owners to our dedicated elected officials, from the farmer down the road to the working mother and widow, from the family taking a bike ride around town or the boy walking his dog to Walter Bradley Park. Thank you for this blessing. You've blessed us with a beautiful place to live. Help us never to take for granted this privilege and just how much we are blessed. Teach us to be grateful, to lead, and to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in. And if you want to know a bit more about my ministry as well as Midway, Kentucky, check out the show notes. And until next time, Dios primero y que Dios te bendiga. Ciao.